Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Hope everybody's well. Uh, we're back after our summer break for our, our first, I guess it's autumn webinar. It's feeling particularly autumnal today in Nottingham. Um, who we got on today? Uh, hi, Carolyn from York. Hope you're well. Uh, Claire over in Belfast. Colin down in East Anglia. Uh, Guy. Um, down south, at least from Nottingham. Welcome, everybody. Um, really looking forward to today's session. Um, as a as the screen says, we're going to be talking about everything you need to know about Vouch Force 2024 top rated guide. Can't believe we're talking about 2024. Um, and joining us today uh, to help us talk about this um, is Alex, uh, Alex, uh, MD of Vouch for. Um, and Dan is joining us, obviously, as usual, to keep us on track. Um, Dan's going to do a quick uh, housekeeping section in a second. But in the meantime, I can see that a few of you have not voted in the poll that we put up. So while Dan's doing his housekeeping, and everyone who hasn't voted in the poll, just go and click the poll and go and vote. Um, Dan, over to you, mate. Sure thing. Um, it's good to be back, isn't it? It's not too uh, good to have um, the lack of sunshine, but it's good to be back doing these. So um, as you may know, I'm Dan, the head of branding and design here at Yardstick. And my job, as always, is to make sure we're running smoothly um, and also on time. That's the main thing, isn't it? So I'll be keeping an eye on any technical issues and also any questions that you ask. And as always, we've got plenty of familiar faces in the crowd. So you'll know that these sessions work well with tons of input. So we're going to be getting into the weeds today about Vouched For's top rated guide. So if you want to ask questions, don't be shy. You know, let's make the most of having Alex here with us. And as usual, there are two ways that you can do that. So the chat function at the bottom um, or the Q&A box. I'm going to be monitoring both and reading them out at natural breaks along the way. And then time permitting, we'll have a period at the end where we can sweep any final ones up. And, and as usual, uh, a follow-up email with a recording of this session will be landing in your inbox later on. So don't worry if you miss anything the first time round. You can absolutely watch it later on. So without further ado, Phil and Alex, tell us everything we need to know to make the cut this year. Thanks, mate. Right, so let's look at the um, the, vouch, the, the poll results. Um, Alex, it'd be interesting to get your reaction on these. So we asked, thinking about Vouch Force Top Rated Guide, how are you planning to qualify or to try and qualify? 71% said as a top rated advisor, individual advisor. 11% said top rated firm. 24% said both. 6% said neither. Um, so I'd be interested to see whether those 6% have changed their mind later on. And also, it will be interesting if you want to put your head above the power pit and you're in one of those 6%, just put a note in the chat um, as to why, what's the reason you uh, aren't going to try and qualify. I think that'd be quite useful to know, wouldn't it, Alex? Uh, indeed, yeah. Uh, really interesting results, broadly in line with what I would have expected, to be honest. So... Uh, we typically see many more top-rated advisors than we do firms. We see uh, a bit of crossover, so people going for both. And for the folk in, in the neither camp, as Phil says, would be great to understand why. And, and hopefully in the course of the session, we can uh, give you some food for thought. Thanks, Alex. Right, let's crack on, shall we? What are we going to talk about today? Well, in more detail, uh, we're going to talk about how Vouched For has extended its promotion of the 2024 guide. We're going to talk about some of the benefits of being included. And the meat of this is about the 2024 qualification criteria, which for firms has deviated a little bit from previous years. Uh, we're going to talk about some top tips, things we've seen work at Yardstick over the years to help both individual advisors and firms qualify. And then we're going to touch a bit about how to promote your inclusion into the guide. Um, and we'll be doing another webinar early next year, January, February, to talk about how firms, in more detail, how firms can uh, promote their inclusion. And hopefully we can invite Alex back and Alex will agree to come back for, for that webinar. Um, as Dan says, do ask questions. Um, I want today to be a really interactive session. I want to make sure that nobody leaves this webinar 
with their questions unanswered. Um, so do stick your questions in the Q&A in the chat um, and Dan will cu curate those as we go through. It's also useful if you could share your experiences of last year, what you plan to do this year. Let's get the conversation going. So a little reminder about the top rated guide. So it's published annually and it allows advisors, planners and mortgage brokers to qualify as an individual or as a firm. And the guide, it's a beautiful piece of work. It's fantastic. And it includes a list of all the qualifiers, both as an advisor, mortgage broker, uh, and firms. There's some lovely case studies in there. Might have featured one or two yardstick clients in the past, Alex. Um, and there's some cracking articles about the value of financial advice, financial planning, mortgage advice, et cetera. So I think it's worth just pausing here for a second. And Alex, just getting you to talk about what the aims of the guide are and how they might have changed over the years. Yeah, great question. And the main aim of the guide has always been the same, which is to build public understanding and trust around advice. It sets out to do that in a couple of ways. As, as you've mentioned, there's, there's editorial articles and case studies within the guide that help people understand what it is and how it can help them. And then the second section of the guide calls out those advisors and firms who have qualified as top rated on the strength of their client feedbacks. I'd argue that the aim is, is more important than it has been for, for a long time, that aim of building public understanding and, and trust around advice. Flat stock markets, increasingly attractive cash savings accounts, rising costs, they're all leading to some rash decisions. And added to that, there's been three recent reports, I don't know if, if you saw them, but from the SEA, Boring Money and the Langcat, which highlight that lack of public trust and advice remains the number one reason why people who need it don't engage. So more needs to be done to help the public understand the value of advice. And that's what, what the guide sets out to do. Thanks, Alex. And one of the big differences for 2024 is how the guide will be promoted. So 2023, it was published in March in the Times, distributed in the Times, I think is the correct terminology, Alex. Indeed. Um, and it, that, that distribution is being extended significantly next year. Um, and I think this is fantastic. It's going in the Times in March, the Mail on Sunday in June, and the Telegraph three months later in September. So three bites at the cherry instead of one. There's also going to be some promotion in FT Advisor, as I understand it. And yeah. that means the Times, the Mail, and the Telegraph combined will reach about 3 million consumers. And if that's not enough, it's going to 50,000 accountants and solicitors. So you could argue that qualification this year, it's like 2024, is more important than it's ever been. Um, Alex, why did you, I'm not arguing it, I love it, but why did you decide to extend the promotion of the guide? Well, th there's been there's been loads of great activity recently highlighting how far the advice professions come since RDR and, and the great work that most advisors do for their clients. But so much of this activity takes place within what I describe as the, the industry echo chamber. And what's clear from those reports that I just mentioned is that consumers haven't got the memo. So bluntly, we need to do more. Anyone with a consumer facing channel needs to do more to address this huge, huge problem. And, and the guide is an effective way to do this, as is well illustrated by the story of a, a close relative of mine. I won't disclose who for fear that they'll get hate mail, but when I joined, well, I'll give you a bit, bit, more, bit more information. An 80 year old Scottish man who is very closely related to me, um, when I joined Vouch for, described financial advisors as a bunch of robbing bastards who are just looking to feather their own nest at the expense of yours. Apologies for, for the language, but it's not 
an atypical view, you know, amongst amongst the public. And I was really delighted a couple of years ago when that same individual had read the guide. He called me up. He said he'd read some of the case studies. In fact, the case study he was referring to featured a yardstick client and was about uh, legacy planning. It had, it had changed his view and he'd reached out to a local financial planner to help him put in place a more robust legacy plan, which I found hugely heartening and, and validation of, of what we're seeking to do with the guy. Is your relative going in next year as a case study, Alex? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Bobby Bastard's financial advisor ch changes mind of client. I quite like that. <laughs> um, so though that for me is how the promotion is extended next year and is just just fantastic news and it for me it increases the longevity of the window that will be able to promote firms will be able to promote advisors will and will be able to do it on behalf of firms to promote their inclusion in the guide it extends the good news piece i think there's a question though coming down from Lindsay that we probably should deal with now in terms of good news bad news absolutely yeah so um listen we we welcome challenges and we welcome difficult questions so this is absolutely one of those so Lindsay asks um hi all this year there was a huge amount of negativity from advisors on LinkedIn about the guide I'd not seen this before what do you think caused this who's going with that first Alex you or me you go first I'll go after you Okay. Yeah. So um, th thanks for raising this, Lindsay. O over the years, one of, one of the highlights of my year is the few days after the guide is published in the Times and seeing all the incredibly positive posts from advisors across the UK who are rightly delighted about the fact that they're getting recognition in a national newspaper for doing a brilliant job for their clients. That said, there is always a minority and it really is a minority of posts that are cynical and they perhaps have issue with feedback being used as a, a way to, to measure how, how good an advisor is or, or, or such like. Um, and I, I find it frustrating, to be honest, uh, in, in almost every case I've reached out to these advisors to try and explain what we're seeking to do with the guide. In almost every case, those conversations have helped sort of soften their opinions and actually they've got behind it. Many of those advisors have then gone on to qualify for the guide. But um, yeah, we, we, we won't bring everyone around. I think, I think one thing that I really want to, to see moving forward, and there's been a few good, good movements from, from, from others to, to try and achieve this, is just a, a spirit of more positivity within within the professions you know if i had a pound for every time i've heard something along the lines of the industry's terrible but i'm different i'd be a i'd be a very wealthy man uh, and what it does is is just exacerbate that that problem of public trust and advice i'm i would never say that client feedback alone is is enough you know ultimately the more proof points you can collect and as an advisor the better to, to build public trust and advice but without question, it helps, you know, as that story I shared illustrates, it helps people understand what advice is. It helps people um, have the confidence to, to engage and get the help that they need. Um, so anyway, that's my uh, <laughs> fairly waffly tuppence on the subject. But um, Phil, yeah, keen to hear your thoughts as well. Unsurprisingly, I agree with you. Um, I wonder if, or well, I sense that maybe behind Lindsay's question, and Lindsay, I might be wrong here, but I sense that behind the question might be, well, if there is this negativity, should we be doing it? Should we be associated with it? Um, and yes, for me, is the short answer. And the long, slightly longer answer is that actually, I think the negativity is quite isolated. I think it is um, getting less each year. I think as people understand it, it gets less each year. I also think that often... We live in a bit of an echo chamber on, on LinkedIn and other social platforms where we're following other members of the profession. And therefore, you that any negativity is, is amplified. And for me, 
the best form of social proof, the best form of social proof is always what the people who experience the service say about the service. And your clients experience the service that you are given. And therefore, things such as Google reviews, vouched for reviews, client videos, client surveys, that sort of stuff for me is the most important type of social proof. Other stuff, PR, awards, et cetera, absolutely is part of the mix. But the people who experience this and your service are the most important people to, to listen to. Um, so I hope that provides a bit of comfort, Lindsay. Perhaps you can put a note in the chat and see if Alex and I have answered the question. So I'm going to go on to talk about the benefits of being included. And hopefully that might answer a question that Lloyd's put in as well. So let's talk about the benefits of being included. Um, and then we'll talk about the qualification criteria. Um, so what have we got on this list? The first is obviously the extended reach. It's going in those three publications, the Times, the Telegraph and the Mail on Sunday. Um, and I can absolutely see why Alex and Bouched Hall have chosen those, those publications. Being included in the guide provides, for me, huge validation and also celebration of the work that you do. Part of that is personal. That dopamine hit when a review comes in or when you include it in the guide really can't be underestimated. It provides validation to clients that they are working with the right planner. Provides validation to clients that if they recommend people they care about to you, that those people are going to get a, a benefit from the relationship and an outcome similar to what they've got. Provides validation to professional connections as well, because professional connections probably only get feedback from the clients that they introduce to you. So that validation piece is incredibly important. It also provides validation for your team. If you've got people working in your team, whether it be other advisors, power planners, admin staff, technical staff, whoever it is, it provides validation for them that they are delivering value to people that they work with and also they're working in the right place. So for me, validation and celebration for clients, prospects, professional connections, your team, just a massive part of the, part of the guide. And of course, it provides valuable social proof, and that's a link to the validation piece, to all those groups of people. And we'll talk about that social proof only works if you promote your inclusion in the guide, and we'll talk about how to promote it later. I think as the poll results show earlier, if you qualify as a top-rated firm, you are able to stand out more. Um, the more firms, uh, there's more individual advisors qualifying than, than firms. And therefore, if you qualify as a firm, you're going to stand out more. And also, you'll get greater prominence on the Vouch4 platform, because by dint of being in the guide, you'll have got more reviews, which uh, the recency of reviews, I think, Alex, is part of the algorithm. But also, you've got buttons on there showing top rated, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, there are just huge benefits to being included in the guide. But... Is there anything I've missed off there, Alex? I think you've given a really good summary, Phil. Uh, you know, at high level, it's a way to stand out in, in a language that clients understand. As we've touched on, you know, there's lots of really important trust signals within the, the profession, but not all of them make sense to consumers. So certain qualifications and awards don't make a ton of sense to, to, to everyone. However, people understand client feedback. They understand ratings. And so leveraged effectively, top rated is a really good way to strengthen your online presence and, and to help generate more of what will always be the best kind of inquiries, which is client referrals, professional referrals, and also to help increase conversion. What, what, one thing worth adding, though, is that a lot of our members um, and those who qualify as top rated are actually not that interested in new clients. They're, they're, they're at capacity. And so there's a couple of other um, objectives that come into play for them. Two, two of the main ones being they may be eyeing up an exit in a, in a few years. And so collecting this regular feedback gives them confidence they'll be able to command the best possible exit when the time comes because they can reassure 
any acquirer that they, they put clients at their heart and also that their, their risk is at an acceptable level. Um, the, the other main reason is, is simply pride. Um, you know, a lot of our members work incredibly hard for their clients um, and arguably <laughs> particularly so right now. And they're sick of the portrayal of their profession. You know, they're sick of the look they get at drinks parties when they say they're a financial advisor, and, and rightly so. So they, um, they, you know, <laughs> they, they like to support the, the overall mission of, of what we're doing and, and, you know, publish their, their feedback prominently. It's a really good point about the exit, um, buying up an exit, Alex. Um, I think you probably made the point you did an interview for the exit partnership in their newsletter. Um, in September, it's probably a point you made. Um, but being able to use things like elevation to show lower than average risk markets, um, that's absolutely a, a positive when it comes to exit and a sale. It's a good point. Yeah, and I, th I think it's becoming a, a more important point now. So, that, you know, the last sort of two, three years of obviously seeing a flurry of M&A activity. We work closely with a number of acquirers and, you know, they've they've told us off the record that they've had to do deals where they're taking on, for instance, a greater degree of risk than they're comfortable with, just given the competitiveness in the M&A space. But we are seeing that start to change. So we're starting to see acquirers uh, collect more data, um, demand more from the firms that they're looking to acquire to, to get them comfortable and, and ensure that the deal progresses. Um, I see, Dan, we've had a reply from Lindsay. I'm intrigued to know whether Alex and I have provided enough comfort for Lindsay. Um, you'll be thrilled to know that you have yes so Lindsay says um, it does thank you for us we'd never not do this we're hugely supportive of this guide and have it has been a huge speaking point among our clients and our friends um, I'm very happy to see the longevity of the campaign this year well done all well done Alex thank you Lindsay thanks so, Lindsay that's great to hear so if we've established it's going in far greater amount of uh, publications this year. We talked about some of the benefits of being included. Let's have a look at how you are included. So first thing, deadlines. The reviews received from the 1st of January to the 31st of December 2023 count towards qualification and therefore the deadline is 31st of December 2023. Alex, that's pretty simple. Anything you would add to that? No. No, we're good with that? Okay. Right. To qualify as an individual advisor or planner and mortgage broker, I guess I should say, Alex, um, it's a minimum of 10 reviews with an average of 4.5, an average rating of 4.5 out of 5. I think we're right in saying, Alex, all reviews count, whether it's a first impression a kind of full fat review the first time a client's left one or a top-up review. Correct. And then to be included in the guide, um, if the advisor, the planner, the mortgage broker gets those 10 reviews and meets the minimum score, um, they need to have verified membership, which is £54 a month plus VAT, um, and pass your checks. Is that a fair summary, Alex? Yeah, spot on. Anything I've missed off there? No. no. This, this one is... Uh... More, more simple, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> Top-rated firm is, is a little more complex, as we'll come on to. Let's have a crack at top-rated firm then, shall we? That was a great segue. Thanks, Alex. Um, so you need to ask 100% um, of your clients, minus any exceptions. So you need to have asked 100% of your clients for a review, um, minus any exceptions. And Alex, is it um, a review in the last 12 months or this year? It is this year, so it's since the 1st of January. Got it. So in the calendar year of 2023. The exceptions, new clients who have been with you for fewer than three months. Um, I would argue that new clients actually make a really good people to leave reviews, but that's probably a separate conversation. Um, clients whose original firm was acquired by or merged with yours in the past 12 months. Clients without an email address for obvious reasons. Celebrity clients intrigued me, Alex. Some Z lister from Love Actually five years ago. I'm not <laughs> sure that, that I've been interested in the definition of celebrity clients, but celebrity clients are not on the uh, on the excluded list. 
the reason for that, if, if it's helpful to share, because I was, I was very reluctant to add this to the list, but we we um, worked closely with a couple of firms who'd raised it uh, to get a better understanding. And, and basically their communication with their celebrity clients is enormously restricted. So um, it's it's very, very difficult for them to send something like a feedback request through to their celebrity clients. I don't think in the case of these particular firms, they were talking about Z-Lister, Love Island uh, contestants from a few years ago, um, pop stars, footballers and the like. But um, yeah, after much consideration, we thought it was fair to add it to the list given the points they raised. Uh, clients who are unwell. Clients who advise us are on notice and potentially leaving. Clients who have previously left a review in the last 12 months. No need to double up. No reason why they wouldn't give you an extra review then. Corporate clients and clients who have not paid you for a service within the last 12 months. So apart from the definition of the Love Island celebrity, Alex, anything that you would add to the uh, exclusion list? No, that's it. But I, one, the, uh, the one thing I would say, actually, is, you know, these are exemptions as far as the criteria is concerned. But, you know, my strong steer is always to invite all your clients for feedback, you know, unless there's an exceptionally good reason not to um and you know that would include any celebrity clients where you're you're comfortable inviting them and able to to invite them for, for feedback i would completely agree with that um i would occasionally hear advisors and planners say um i will ask our clients our new clients for a review in x amount of time when they've experienced the service and it's almost as if there is some magical point after two years, three months, six days, 10 hours to ask for a review. And that absolutely isn't. Mm. One of the key times a financial planner will positively impact their clients' lives is in those early stages mm. when they experience the benefits of financial planning. So why wouldn't you ask for a review at that point? So I'm completely with you, Alex, whilst a lot of these um, on the exceptions list makes sense, I will be asking as many people as possible. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, there's three trigger points that we recommend. So once is the first time is, an, is a first impression um, feedback form sent out after an initial meeting. The second is after a, a new client's been through that initial advice process. And then it's kind of after every annual review thereafter. And I, I totally get why some people are nervous about collecting feedback at those different points the, the the bit that we we tend to get the most resistance is around that first impression review form after the initial meeting but it's so powerful you know particularly if it's positioned correctly with the prospect it shows that you really care about delivering a great service right from the outset uh, the story i sometimes share here is um in the summer at after much persuasion from my family, we, we went to this all-inclusive hotel that has just got the most phenomenal word of mouth I've heard around any hotel that we've we've ever been to. You know, everyone at our sort of life stage raved about this place. And on at the end of day one of staying at this hotel, we got a feedback request. And it was just asking how things are going, whether there's anything that they could do to improve our state so i duly completed it and sure enough everything they mentioned was was rectified now i imagine if you went into most hotels and said invite feedback after the first day of someone's trip you'd get huge pushback but in the case of this hotel you know i, I think it's central to the reputation they've built it showed me as a client from the outset that they really really cared about having me having a great experience and there were a couple of tiny niggles i mentioned in the form that were sorted straight away and really set us up for a, for a great trip. It's a good point about asking when you should ask for reviews. Dan, Claire's put a question in that pertains exactly to that. Um, yeah, they certainly have. So Claire asks, um, is it best practice to ask every ongoing client every year at their annual review? Uh, yeah, both Alex and I are nodding. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely believe it is. Um, I, I, we talk a lot about uh, online reviews here at Yardstick, who is the definitive guide to online reviews that we published only last week. And for my mind, after every annual review meeting, there should be an email or a message going out to clients 
saying we collect reviews on Google and Vouch for, please leave us a review. Um, it's just such an important time to be asking clients for a review. They are so positive, hopefully, about their financial future. They feel more confident, reassured. They've got more peace of mind. It is the perfect time to swoop in and strike with a review request. Alex, anything you'd add there? I couldn't agree more. You know, added to that, particularly when you're asking a few more questions, which our review form involves, asking them at that point means that they're more likely to have a fresher memory of the experience and give you more valuable feedback. The, the key is really how you position it, you know, and, and sometimes advisors will make the mistake of, of not sort of talking about feedback with their clients. They just ping out a request and, and their response rate suffers a bit. Well, maybe they talk about it, but they position feedback very much as a huge favor that the client is doing then the advisor. But the advisors that get the, the best response rate are those that say something like, you know, I really care about great service. Your feedback helps me do that. So, you know, I'd be grateful if you could take a moment to leave me some feedback. And what that does is position the benefit feedback in the client's camp, which, which makes them much more likely to, to respond and engage. Thank you, Alex. So we've established who we need to ask. Let's look at the response rates we need to get. And this is where we're going to get into the weeds, as Dan called it earlier, about the qualification. So we'll take this slowly because it has changed a bit from last year, hasn't it, Ali? Yeah. Um, so first thing, feedback needs to be collected for all advisors in the firm. We can't leave any out, um, which is um, pretty sensible, really, seeing as we've got to ask 100% of clients minus the exceptions. So that's pretty straightforward. We then need a minimum response rate of 20%, with at least 20 of those responses answering the elevation question set. And that's 20 answering the elevation question set per firm, not per individual advisor. We're good so far, Alex? Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, your average firm rating needs to be slightly higher than the individual advisor. So it needs to be 4.7 out of five. And we've got two new benchmarks added in, two new benchmarks added in, and two more um, hurdles to get past for 2024's qualification. And the first of those is passionate advocacy. So for financial advice, 20% um, of your clients need to say that they are passionate advocates for the business and 50% for mortgage protection. And risk markers need to be at 75% or above. So there are two key um, new benchmarks, two requirements that have been added in this year. Alex, just explain for everyone on today the reason for adding those in, if that's okay. Absolutely. So after the guide was published last year, we undertook a really in-depth research process. We spoke to a lot of the advisors and firms that we work closely with to understand kind of what they felt went well about, about the guide in 2023 and, and how we could improve it. There were a few things that came out of our research around top rated firms specifically. A couple of the most common themes were that we needed to make the process a bit easier for, for advisors. So in previous years, you'd have to apply and then you'd need to tell us when you think you'd qualified. So we could be sure that you'd invited all your clients and achieved the requisite response rate and so on. Um, and also we got feedback that we, we should make it more robust. Uh, added to that was the need to um, simplify the process for us. We, we received several hundred applications for, for top rated firm last year with only about 100 of them making the cut. And it, it just sucked up a huge amount of our team's time going back and forwards, understanding whether they'd invited all clients and whether they'd achieved response rate, et cetera. So the, the answer to all those above points is to use elevation the elevation system is our best read on how good a job a firm is doing when a firm sets up on elevation we work closely with them to ensure that they've invited 
all their clients. That's kind of baked into the, the process. The system also shows them how they compare against industry averages in areas like advocacy and risk. So firms need to be above those benchmarks for both areas. One, one thing we were keen to do, so I know some of you listening are, are set up on the elevation system, is we didn't want to create a moving target. So rather than just enabling you to, or requiring you to exceed the benchmark shown within the system, we took a fixed benchmark, which are those that you can see on screen for 2023 year to date, so that you know exactly what you're aiming for. And that's, that's a good point, Alex, because I've got a screenshot of a elevation uh, dashboard here. And what you can see on the elevation dashboard is actually that for this particular firm, um, they are at 84% in terms of risk and 4% ahead. Therefore, the benchmark or th therefore the uh, average is 80% here. Um, and in terms of client advocacy, it would be 24%. But I think it's important that we just re-emphasize, Alex, that actually the herd rates are either 20%, 50% or 75%. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, and what you can do, because ultimately we're looking at your average across the year, you're able within elevation to filter your scores over a certain period. So you can set the filters for your goal scores to 2023 to see exactly how you're doing. And as Phil says, you just need to exceed those fixed benchmarks that are shown on screen the ones that are currently showing within the elevation platform are slightly higher than those. And, and the reason for that is that with consumer duty, um, you know, taking effect from end of July, we've seen a lot of firms collecting and acting on their data, which has ultimately raised the industry standard um, from where it was at the start of the year. Thanks, Alex. So just finishing off a couple more slides on the qualification. Um, one of the requirements is that firms and advisors publicly display all feedback on vouched for. And that the reviews, as Alex said earlier, are subject to analysis by the elevation system. Alex, just explain a bit more about what you mean by publicly display all feedback on vouched for. Yeah, so a key part of the top rated campaign from the very start has been transparency. So, so it didn't really feel right to enable firms to collect feedback on elevation privately, exceed the benchmarks, and then be able to qualify as top rated without any of that feedback being in the public domain. The most valuable way to put that feedback in the public domain is through one of our verified profiles. So if you go on to vouch for search by an advisor name and you, you see a verified profile with all their checks and reviews and, and, and such like that's the most valuable way to to, to put it public however as, as to the greatest extent possible i'm keen to ensure that the, the cost isn't uh, a barrier to people engaging with top rated it is to a point um but i'm keen to keep that to a minimum and therefore if any firm does qualify as top rated and based on all the criteria that you've, you've just been through, um, wants to put it public on vouch for, but doesn't want to take out a verified profile for each of their advisors, we're building a basic solution to enable them to do that. It won't be as valuable as, as verified, but they'll be able to do that without any additional charge. Thanks, Alex. And this is a nice, uh, again, another nice segue into the elevation part of this. And this will answer, uh, certainly Mark, your question, and maybe a couple of others. So in terms of qualification as a top rated firm, I think it's worth emphasizing this is for top rated firm, Alex, mm -hmm. not for, for individual advisors who want to go into the guide. If you qualified for the guide as a top rated firm in 2023, you've got two choices, I think we're right in saying, Alex. The first is you apply for top rated firm status without cost and vouched for in the background will run um, your feedback through the elevation system and compare it to benchmarks. If you choose that route with no cost, say this assumes you qualify for 2023, you'll have no access to the elevation dashboards. And there will be a call with vouched for to um, review your data. Second option, if you qualified as a top rated firm in 2023, 
is to sign up at a firm level for elevation at a 75% discount. And that's £10 per advisor per month plus VAT. So 12 quid uh, per advisor per month. And that gives the firm central access to firm level dashboards. So you'll be able to see whether you are um, above or below those metrics we spoke about earlier. So those are two choices if you qualified as a top rated firm last year. If you didn't qualify as a top rated firm last year, say last year, 2023's guide, sorry, um, then elevation, the elevation product is £40 a month per advisor plus VAT. But if you combine it with um, verified membership, the total cost is 85 per advisor per month plus VAT instead of 94. Alex, I need a little sip of water after that. Um, you um, just talk us through um, anything that I got wrong there or anything that you want to, to add. Hey, you, got, you got it exactly right, Phil. The, the reason for having a, a different sort of way of accessing elevation for firms that have previously qualified as, as, as top rated versus those that haven't is that we recognise that many of those firms that have previously qualified as top rated have already put in a, a huge amount of work this year to become top rated again. So it didn't feel um, right to require them to, to pay for full access to elevation if they didn't want to. Um, for everyone else, this is something we, we spent a huge amount of time agonizing over within the business, to be honest. You know, we, we explored every option from giving elevation, you know, for free through to um, uh, through to charging for it. We ultimately settled on this course of action because what we what we want to ensure with top rated firm is that, you know, per the feedback that we received, it is as robust as possible. And where a firm is set up on elevation, we know they're collecting regular data from their clients. We can see exactly how they're doing against industry benchmarks on an ongoing basis. And crucially, we can see what they're doing to act on the data. That's such a key requirement within the consumer duty, of course. It's not just about collecting the right data, but it's, a, it's about acting on it. So there's various email alerts and action lists, which aren't live yet, but will be soon. That, that show advisors the most powerful things that they can do to improve client experience, and it will ultimately log whether they've taken those actions. So it is without question our best data source, um, our best method of assessing how good a job firms are doing, which is why it's it's a central part of the criteria this year. Thanks, Alex. Right, we've got some questions, Dan, uh, about qualification. So let's spend five minutes doing those, and then we're gonna talk about some top tips to help firms and advisors qualify and a little bit about promotion. Wonderful. Right. So uh, my first question is from Rob. Now, Rob, fantastic question. Um, if we hit the criteria, do we automatically appear in the guide or do we need to apply? How do we get in this guide, Alex? <laughs> uh, so if you are, if you're an advisor with verified membership of Vouch4, you've hit the criteria there's, there's absolutely nothing that you need to do. You, you'll get regular emails from us in the lead up to qualifying, telling you kind of how many reviews are, are needed to, to enable you to hit the criteria. And then once you've qualified, you will be notified of that. Um, and what we do in the lead up to the campaign is we'll, we'll tag you on LinkedIn, telling you and your, your network that you've, you've qualified as a top rated advisor and will feature in the guide. At firm level, it's, um, it's similar. So in the way that, you know, unlike the way that it worked previously, whereby you needed to kind of tell us when you thought you'd, you'd qualified, there was no other way of doing it, but it was a bit of a pain for, for firms. As long as you're set up on elevation, we're going to be constantly reviewing the data. You'll be assigned one of our success team who will be working close with, closely with you. And a big part of their job is to help you get maximum value from the, the platform, including qualifying as a top rated firm if you'd like to. So they will tell you how you're doing and when you meet the criteria, if that's something that you're you're aiming for. Brilliant, thanks, Alex. Um, next question from Guy. This is a wonderfully niche question. So um, regarding reviews for all advisors in the firm, what if we have an advisor who has come off vouched for because they are retiring in the next year? Hmm. So typically, you know, the, the requirement is that all advisors need to be included um 
However, if there's a couple of circumstances in, in which I'd be I'd be willing to waive that. So one would be if let's say you've got a brand new advisor who has got no clients, it would be you know it's kind of impossible to to invite client feedback for them. So so they needn't be included. The other would be if if the advisor in question is going to be retiring before the guide is published, then I think it's reasonable that they don't have to be included within the process. Brilliant, thanks. Um, next question I'm going to choose is from Claire, who asks, um, can I ask why mortgage and protection has a higher passionate advocacy rate? It's a really great question. And it's one that we've, yeah, we, we've debated at length within the business. Um, and we've reached out to clients to try and better understand it. I mean, what, what passionate advocacy is, is essentially measuring is, is client delight. And the theory that we've landed on, though I welcome others from, from the audience and from, from, from you, Phil, is that there's a lot more to the financial planning process. It's obviously a longer process. There's a lot more to it. And therefore, getting a sort of absolutely smashing it, every component part of it out the park is arguably a bit harder than when you've got a more transactional relationship. Let's say, you know, if someone's just looking for a mortgage and you get them onto a mortgage that they're confident is the very best mortgage for them, it's kind of, it's a quicker route to delight for them than you can argue is possible within the financial planning relationship where kind of the job is, it's never completely done, right? You know, you're working towards ever-changing goals over a very long period of time and there's other factors at play, including things like market performance. That's our best shot at a hypothesis based on the data and conversation with clients. But Phil, um, yeah, do you have any anything to add on that? Any thoughts? I would agree. I think it's um, about immediate versus delayed gratification. Mm. Um, Dan, you just moved house. Yeah. Um, and I am very happy. I'm sure you'll be leaving your mortgage advisor a uh, voucher for review because they've helped you get into the house of your dreams. Um, yeah, it's um I was having a conversation with um, a mortgage broker yesterday and it was interesting that they're often the person you pay the least to during the house buying process but offer the greatest value. And um why wouldn't you leave a review if that's the case? Uh whereas financial planning, yes, there are absolutely benefits immediately. But often it takes longer to achieve aspirations, goals and objectives. So yeah, I completely agree with that, Alex. Dan, back to you for more questions. Yeah, I'm I'm conscious of time. So I'm just going to choose um, one more and then we'll sweep some up at the end. Yeah, um, cool. I'm going to choose Andy's question. Andy asks, um, is it too late to qualify this year if we don't have a vouched for profile? Or can we still qualify as long as we meet the volume criteria by the end of December? Um, it's not too late, Andy. So, but you 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 probably want to get cracking fairly soon. Um, if you email guide at vouchforward.co.uk, one of the team will, will reach out, kind of understand what you're looking to achieve and, and, and help you get set up. It's very easy to invite feedback through the system. So it takes a matter of minutes. You can upload a client list and tailor the invite message. I think Phil's going to share a share a template that you can you can add to the system as well if you prefer. And you know the average response rate we th see through the system at the moment is around 45%. So depending on how big your client bank is you know it's certainly achievable to hit the um hit the criteria by qualification deadline of 31st of december so yeah thank you alex and uh, thanks dan we'll do um next couple of sections and then we'll hang around and answer any questions uh for as long as necessary so we've talked about the promotion we've talked about how to qualify as an individual advisor as a firm Let's have a think about some top tips. Andy, these are things that maybe you could start start using um, if you want to qualify by the end of the year. So the first thing, and I would say that these tips are all based on experience. So every year at Yardstick, uh, to work with our clients, uh, we put a big board up on the wall of all the firms that we're trying to help qualify, uh, and we mark them off, we tick them off as we go, and we've got a pretty good success rate. So these tips are based on what we do in our experience. So the first thing to do is calculate your targets. Um, what, do your, what do your targets need to be, whether it's around your score, 
the number of reviews that you need, or those two additional benchmarks for firms. You need to understand what you're aiming at. I would then uh, run a what I would call a one-off project. We sometimes talk about this as a booster project asking all clients to leave a review. And I know you've got some exceptions and Alex and I spoke about this earlier, but I would be asking pretty much all clients to leave you a review. I'd also be making it clear that those reviews can be uh, brand new reviews if they've not done one before or a top up review if they've previously done one. Because some clients might think that I've already left a review, don't need to do this again. But of course, they're reviewing an ongoing service. The other thing I'd say is some advisors, planners have a bit of a limiting belief that people won't leave multiple reviews. They absolutely will. And to prove that point, we've got a few firms that we work with that in 2024 will be the third year that they've qualified as a top rated firm. So run that one up, one off project, asking all clients to leave a review whether it's a top-up review or a brand new review. I would be explaining why the review is particularly important at this time of year. I'd be talking about the top rated guide. I'd be talking about the fact that for the first time in 2024, it's published in three national newspapers. And I will be adding in Alex's very valid point earlier that by getting these reviews and getting the the feedback on each question, you as a business and as an individual advisor or planner can improve the service that you deliver. So calculate targets, one-off project. When you message them using the vouch for system, explain those three things. Then check back and see whether you have qualified or not, remembering the new criteria. If you are short, in our experience, you would probably only be short by a relatively small number. So then pick up the phone and say to people, just chat to clients, send you the email, would you mind, really important. And get their verbal agreement on the phone and ask them then how they'd like to receive the link. Do you want me to send it again via the virtual system? Do you want me to email it? Do you want me to send it by WhatsApp? We've seen some firms do really good things with WhatsApp recently. And then strike while the iron is hot. Strike while the iron is hot and immediately send the link over. Don't do it later on that day or the next day or next week. Do it immediately. And in my experience, when firms follow that process, calculate targets, initial project with the right wording, checking back and then topping up, that is generally enough to get the firms who are giving good enough service to qualify as a top rated firm and individual advisors and planners as well. To help you guys um, in the follow up, which we will send out later on today, um, we're going to uh, you we're going to give you some text um, that we would use to have start off a 10. You want to edit it for your own language in your own style. But our start of a 10 for asking clients for these reviews. Um, and that there'll be a link in the uh, in the follow-up to that. Um, and Alex, you gave out an email address earlier on. That is a link in that uh, follow-up as well to that email address. Alex, anything you would add there before we go on to talk briefly about promoting the inclusion? Anything you would add to um, getting qualified? Uh, only the, you know, our, our team... Are, are are tasked with with helping in any in any way they can. So you know, if, if you get stuck, feel free to to reach out to them, uh, ask for assistance, and and they'll be only too happy to provide it. And, and the same would apply to any yardstick clients that are on this on this call. Um, we're having regular conversations with our clients on a monthly basis. Um, Claire, for example, we've got a call on Friday, I think, um, and we'll be talking about this during our monthly marketing meeting calls. So. That's how you uh, get qualified. Let's have a quick look to start you thinking about how to promote this next year. Now, whilst a, I think it was Lloyd earlier, talked about um, how do we make this more than just an ego boost? And it is quite a nice ego boost. We all need our ego polishing from time to time, don't we? 
Um, but how do we make it more than that? So here are a few things, um, and we're going to do separate webinar about this. These are the sorts of things you can start to think about. We can use Vouchful's promotional assets. Some really good stuff that Vouchful does. Top rated certificate. Uh, the digital badges are great. Um, you doing trophies next year, Alex? Yeah. Yeah. Trophies next year are really good. Uh, we've got a client that whenever you want to call, mantle piece behind him, you can see the vouch for trophies lined up. Um, you could create your own assets. There are other assets that you could create. But most importantly, you build a plan for this uh, promotion. And again, webinar in January, February, uh, we will show you how to create that plan. And that plan is essentially a list of things that need doing, a list of things that need updating, different months of the year, especially now as the fact that the promotion is going to be elongated over, I guess, a six-month period from March to September. So really important that we don't just have a plan for March, we have a plan for the rest of the year. And that plan should include things like updating key pages on your website. We need to make sure that the key pages, the most popular pages, maybe the top 10, are updated. We should be emailing clients, prospects, and professional connections. Um, I would say probably on that first publication date, and maybe um, in the uh, on the other publication dates in the mail and the telegraph as well, but certainly on that first publication date. Um, and you can get creative with that. Um, I've seen advisors where they've taken a video of them walking into the news agent on the Saturday morning, opening the Times, pulling it out, finding their name, and that sort of stuff. You can get really creative there. Update your collateral. Use the badges uh, that Vouch will provide to update things like stationery, brochures, email signatures, all that sort of stuff that's in Dan's domain. On social media, update your profiles. You've got the header at the top of your LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram profiles. Start using the vouch for badges on there. Um, and then start posting on your social media accounts prior to the first guide being issued and published on the day. And then on those other subsequent publication days for the Mail and the Telegraph. There is so much you can be doing. And um, it's probably not a point to be going into too much detail here. We can do that after Christmas. But the key takeaway from this will maybe the two key takeaways in terms of promotion. Number one, have a plan. And number two, just can't emphasize enough the importance of PRing the PR. Yeah, if you're in the Times, as firms will be, or at least in the guide distributed in the Times, Alex will say that, um, really important that you promote your inclusion. If you don't promote your inclusion, you're going to get less benefit from it. Um, so, Lloyd, glad those slides are in there, and hopefully that's given you a few ideas. Um, right, before we go to questions, a bit of yardstick news. Um, our next webinar, uh, 10 a.m., Wednesday, the 18th of October. 10 ways that guarantee your website is different and stands out from the crowd. 10 ways guarantee your website is different and stands out from the crowd. One of the things we've noticed is that firms come to us and say, we want a different type of website. They always focus on design, always on design. There are so many other ways you can differentiate your website from your peers and competitors. So that's what we're going to be talking about on Wednesday, the 18th of October. Dan, if you could just pop a link in. Yeah, already have done. So I can hear Nottingham's council house bells. We've finished smack on 11 o'clock, which is pretty damn good. But let's hang around and answer any questions that we've got left. Dan. Brilliant. Right. So um, let's start with a question from Mark. Um, another great challenging question. You guys have been excellent with the, the input today. So Mark asks, um, I was advised last year that I could not be a top rated firm as I was a sole advisor. Therefore, although we met the um, assessments, we did not qualify. So why should we have to pay more in 2024? Um, thanks for the question, Mark. I'm keen to understand more uh, and would love to follow up after this because one, one person firms can indeed qualify as top rated provided that they meet all the criteria. There are a couple of rules around that. So they need to be a, a sort of firm in their own right. 
and such like but i'd be keen offline to pick up with you and, and better understand sort of what, what was discussed and why you didn't qualify because the top rated firm process is deliberately set up to not be sizest and, and plenty of the people that qualified last year are one person operations alex could you just put your email address in the chat if you don't mind so uh, mark can follow up yeah of course back to you dan Brilliant. While Alex is doing that, um, uh, another comment from Mark. This is just following up your top tips, Phil. Um, and for Mark, the thing that's worked for them is uh, we found two in particular that helped us increase our reviews. The first was to move um, asking for the review on all mortgages to a week after purchase rather than on completion. As people are busy moving, I can absolutely vouch for that. Um, <laughs> And a follow-up 10 days after. So that seems to be the sweet spot. And that seems to be the point where I left my review for my broker, actually. Um, second, we advised clients that we merged our review and customer service questionnaire into a single item to make it quicker and easier for them to complete. So reducing the, that friction works for Mark. Um, now, second question I'll choose is from an anonymous attendee. It always sounds quite mysterious, doesn't it, when we get an anonymous question? Um, and they ask, how do firm ratings link to advisor ratings? Are they just an average or are there different weightings given to first impression reviews slash full reviews? So firm ratings are an average of advisor, all, all the reviews, all the ratings collected by advisors associated with that firm. So that's the first bit. In terms of weighting, so client reviews are given a slightly higher weighting than first impression reviews. So a first impression review will count for half of the, the value that a full client review will. Lovely stuff. Um, so let's go for Abdul's question. Abdul says, uh, can we link vouched for reviews to Google reviews? Or are the two things separate? Uh, so in, in terms of how you link them, Abdul, currently they are separate. Uh, you can either invite reviews on on vouch for or google we do at some point plan to get around to making it easier to do both it isn't possible to do a, a direct integration whereby you could essentially collect feedback and publish it both to both platforms not because i wouldn't want to do that i'd love to do it but it's it's it would require google to to play ball um However, we yeah, th there is something planned at some point in our product roadmap, which would essentially, at the end of the review journey, take the sort of key qualitative part of the feedback you've received, which is usually the answer to the how did the advisor help you question. And then essentially the, the, the reviewer could just copy and paste that onto Google using a link supplied through the feedback form. That's not live yet and, and probably won't be for a few months, I'm afraid. But um, but. Certainly, yeah, the, the way that a lot of firms will do it is to in, invite both. Um, I think you guys do it. You, you guys with your clients do both. Is it the same time, Phil? Or? Yeah, generally, it's one email with two links. Here's the link for Vouchable. Here's a link for Google. Um, really interestingly, if you like this sort of thing, uh, despite the fact that, Alex, uh, at Vouchable, um, you guys asked a lot more questions than Google. Um, Google asks two, what's the score out of five, and leave a comment. Uh, in our experience, for every one Google review a firm gets, they'll get between five and 10 on vouchable. And that's why, for me, the, the, and there's other reasons as well, but the, the pairing between the two platforms is, is absolutely essential. Um, one of the things I would ask you guys, Alex, to, to chat to your dev team about is just this issue of duplication. Uh, of reviews sometimes google take reviews down that they see as duplicate content um, but anything to make the process easier um, to get a google review and a voucher review at the same time would be i think welcome to everybody on this webinar mm. absolutely yeah it's um i know it's something you've, you've written a lot about phil but trying to, to better understand why they do or don't publish certain bits of feedback would, would certainly be helpful for that process yeah one of the things we've noticed actually is google reviews do disappear infrequently but they're so hard to get, it's a real pain. Um, and we've noticed um, firms who are following our three steps to claim them back that we've developed are actually getting them back on Google. Still a bit of a pain, but they are coming back, whereas before they used to be lost in the ether and you would never hear back from Google. Yeah, it's, it's a curious one, actually. I, I, I find it a bit frustrating in that we, um, um, 
the, there was a, a personal issue that someone within our team had with someone in their personal life and the, that individual decided to leave bad reviews for us on Google as a way to get at the member of the team. Wow. And those were published by Google. <clears throat> However, um, lots of valid bits of feedback left by um, consumers or advisors who had definitely used our platform didn't. So it's um, uh, it's a bit of an ongoing challenge making sure that the the right ones get published. Yeah, no, I do get that. Dan, a couple more questions before we end. Sure thing. Yeah, this is where we hear that disgruntled person works for Google. So the <laughs> inside man. Um, uh, let's go for um, Miles' this question. And I'm imagining the answer is going to be just get them to um, leave a review for each of you. But Miles asks, um, we have a firm we always use for mortgages for our clients. Will there ever be a collaborative rating? Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, yeah, my, my sort of go-to on that would be, as, as you suggest, Dan, to collect different bits of feedback to, to sort of um, measure satisfaction across the, the full journey. Que the question we are starting to get a bit more is is more kind of, measuring the so within a firm let's say a power planner is has been very involved in the process alongside the financial planner and maybe there's a couple of other internal team members you know a tax specialist or something and trying to sort of fairly capture the role that each of them have played in the process and to help with that though i think we've got a bit further to go to be honest is uh, you know there's certain questions that are now included within the feedback form which sort of capture sentiment across that broader journey not just the interactions with the the kind of main point of contact who's typically the financial planner or, or the mortgage broker but in the instance described i 100 percent advocate for collecting two bits of feedback thank you now i believe this is our final question until um anybody jumps in with another but um this is a more broad vouched for question than the top rated guide, but who better to answer it than the managing director of vouched for. Um, so this is from Stephen, who says, we charge tiered fees, but our profile page does not seem to cater for this. Am I correct? Yeah, it should do, Steve. So you can add fees. Um, when, when you log into a voucher account, you should be able to add fees and how they change dependent on wealth level. And then on the sort of front end of the site, so what the consumer sees, they can then go in and say, okay, right, I've got 250K of assets or whatever it might be, and then be able to see the appropriate fee that you would charge. But um, yeah, do reach out to one of the team. They'd be happy to, to chat you through it and ensure it's, it's all working as it should be. Lovely stuff. Thanks so much. Um, we are all out of questions, I believe. Thank you, Dan. So, huge thank you to Alex for taking the time to come and talk to us today. Um, Alex, it's been insightful, um, and everyone has left with their questions answered, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, if you've got any questions after the webinar, um, Alex's email address is in the uh, chat function, and we'll be following up, and there's a, a link to an email in there with uh, where you can email specific questions about the guide. We'll get the uh, recording out this afternoon. There's some useful links in there. And look forward to seeing everybody. Name up in lights, March next year, qualified as either a top-rated advisor or a top-rated firm. Dan, thank you for being here as usual. Alex, thanks again. Um, see everybody for next month's webinar. Cheers. Bye-bye. Take care, guys. Bye. Thanks all.